Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to our virtual science cafe, uh, the special uh, homecoming edition, homecoming this weekend. Um, today's topic is global famine after nuclear war with Professor Alan Robach. My name is Brian McGonigal. I'm the manager of alumni and community engagement at SEBS and for the New Jersey Agricultural Experiment Station. Uh, just a couple of things before we get started. Uh, this session is being recorded. It will be posted on our YouTube page and it will be shared with all registrants. Um, questions, if you have any, you can share them at any time uh, during the presentation uh, through the chat function. And before we get started, I will introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Alan Robach. He is a distinguished professor of climate science in the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers. He graduated from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1970 with a BA in meteorology and from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology where he got his PhD in 1977, also in meteorology. Before graduate school, he served as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Philippines. He was a professor at the University of Maryland and as well as the state climatologist of Maryland before coming to Rutgers in 1998. His areas of expertise include climate intervention, also known as geoengineering, climate, climatic effects of nuclear war, and the effects of volcanic eruptions on climate. He serves as associate editor of Reviews of Geophysics, the most highly cited journal in the earth sciences. His honors include being a fellow of the American Geophysical Union, the American Meteorologi Meteorological Society, and the American Association for the Advancement of Science as well as a recipient of the AMS Jewel Charney Medal. Professor Robach was a lead author of the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 2007. In 2017, the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for its work to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons and for its groundbreaking efforts to achieve a treaty-based prohibition of such weapons, based partly on the work of Professor Robach. So with that, I will uh, kick it over to you, Professor, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much for inviting me to give this talk. I uh, wanna talk about global famine after nuclear war. And let me just... Uh, I'd... Okay. This work has been funded by the Open Philanthropy Project, which and by National Science Foundation. I first want to remind us and acknowledge that uh, Henry Rutgers, the namesake of Rutgers University, owned slaves, as did many of the early presidents of Rutgers College. Slave labor built the Rutgers campus. The land on which Rutgers sits was stolen from the Lenny. Lenape natives. Rutgers benefited from the Land Grant Morrill Act, which allowed New Jersey to sell land taken from Western Native Americans for the benefit of Rutgers. If you want to know more about that, you can read the Scarlet and Black Project at Rutgers. I also wanted to uh, talk about Sherry Rowland. He won the Nobel Prize in chemistry for his work on figuring out the ozone hole and ozone depletion. And he said, what's the use of having depleted, developed a science well enough to make predictions if in the end, we're all, all we're gonna do is stand around and wait for them to come true. He also said, is it enough for a scientist simply to publish a paper? Isn't it a responsibility of scientists if you believe you've found something that can affect the environment, isn't it your responsibility to actually do something about it enough so that action actually takes place? And this has motivated me to do the work that I'm going to tell you about. So I'm going to talk about nuclear winter theory. We can't test the in the real world, so we look at analogs, policy implications, and then doing something about it. This is a picture taken three years ago at the American Geophysical Union meeting of us old guys who've been working on this for decades. Rich Turco, Brian Toon, Tom Ackerman, me, and Gira Stenchikov. Uh, Brian Tuner and I lead this, this project that I'm going to talk to you about, and Gira Stenchikov worked was a professor at Rutgers, a research professor, until he went to the King Abdullah University of Science and Technology about 15 years ago. 
we also work with a lot of young people and and so we're uh we uh i work with uh Cheryl Harrison and Kim Shearer, who are oceanographers, and, and Nikki also, and Lily and, and Jonas are crop modelers, and Julie works on uh, how cities might burn, and Mike and Brian and Chuck and Josh are climate modelers. The presentation is based on a lot of journal articles that we write, including in high profile journals like uh, Science and Nature and Proceedings of National Academy, but Policymakers don't really read those, but if you want to read read them, you you can, and they're all on my webpage, which I'll show you again at the end. The main paper I'll talk about is this one by Lily, which just was just published in Nature Food. She was the first author about global how food would be affected. So here's the story. Here's our beautiful planet, but after a nuclear war, it might look like this with a cloud of smoke covering Earth, blowing into the southern hemisphere and blocking out the sun. And if there's enough sunlight, enough blocking, it would get cold, dry, and dark at the Earth's surface, and this would be a nuclear winter. Temperatures would get below freezing even in the summertime. The heating of the upper atmosphere would also destroy ozone and let more ultraviolet radiation through. So here's a history of the deployed nuclear warheads on Earth, and you can see there was an arms race and going up and up and up. And in the 1980s, the arms race ended, the number started to go down. Why? Well, I think our work has something to do with it. In 1982, Paul Crutzen, who shared the Nobel Prize with, with Sherry Rowland and John Burks, pointed out there'd be a lot of smoke after a nuclear war and it would get dark. And then two different groups, a Russian group, Alexandrov and Stenchikov, and an American group, Turco, Tune, Ackerman, Pollock, and Sagan, calculated how the temperature would change. And they both found that temperatures would get below freezing, that there would be a nuclear winter. And then I published a paper in Nature and, and a group from the National Center for Atmospheric Research published a paper, all getting the same results. And then the arms race ended. Uh, why did it end? Well, it wasn't the end of the Soviet Union. That Soviet Union didn't end until five years later. It was a decision made by Mikhail Gorbachev and Ronald Reagan. I also wanted to point out that although the numbers of nuclear weapons have been going down, uh, there are still about 10,000 nuclear weapons on the planet. When I do research, I look at data, look at models, and uh, but historians do research but it's by asking people. And so Ronald Reagan said a great many reputable scientists, he called us reputable, are telling us that such a war could end in no victory for anyone because we wipe out the earth as we know it. If you look back to natural calamities back in the 1800s, volcanoes, we saw the weather so changed there was snow in July in many temperate countries, and they call it the year in which there was no summer. Now, if one volcano can do that, what are we talking about with the whole nuclear exchange? It's possible. And Gorbachev said, models made by Russian and American scientists showed that a nuclear war would result in a nuclear winter that would be extremely destructive to all life on earth. The knowledge of that was a great stimulus to us. So it was scientists talking to policy from both sides, Russian and American, and they accepted it because we both got the same results and that was a powerful force. At the time also, there were huge demonstrations, at least in, in dem democracies, demanding an end to the nuclear arms race. People were scared and that resulted in the end of the arms race. And at the time, Gorbachev and Reagan also said a nuclear war must not be fought and can never be, cannot be won. That was 40 years ago. So why am I talking to you about it now? Well, the Cold War and the arms race are, are over. Could the remaining nuclear arsenal still produce nuclear winter? I want to ask that. And now there's more countries with nuclear weapons. There are nine countries with nuclear weapons. What if two of the new countries had a war? What would that cause? What would that do? And so the answer is, yes, we still have enough nuclear weapons to produce nuclear winter. It would last for a decade. And if there was a war, say, between India and Pakistan, who are nuclear nations, it wouldn't be nuclear winter, but it, the direct effects would be horrific and would affect food availab availability for a decade. So we know that temperatures will go down. What I want to talk about is how would it affect food. So just sort of a background, what do nuclear weapons do? This is the upshot knothole test in the Nevada desert. They blew up a nuclear weapon. This is when they were still testing in the atmosphere. And you can see the dignitaries here with their sunglasses and their fingers in their ears. A nuclear weapon is like bringing a piece of the sun to the earth for a fraction of a second. And it would 
release tremendous amounts of heat and light. They built a building in the desert to see what would happen. You can see it's lit up. This is at night, lit up by the blast. And as the fireball rises, the, the shadow gets uh, lower and the building begins to burn. And then the blast wave hits and it blows the building apart. And you might say, well, it's going to blow out the flames, but it's also going to break gas mains. It's going to break electrical wires and, and buildings can burn. The first nuclear war took place in Japan, and we dropped two nuclear weapons on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. This is a map drawn by the U.S. Army showing all the cities that the U.S. burned during that summer, starting with Tokyo in, on March 10th, 1945. Two airplanes with napalm put a flaming X on Tokyo, and then about 300 planes followed with incendiary bombs burning 40% of it to the ground, killing uh, 100,000 people in 24 hours, burned to death, the most ever before or since in the history of the world. And after that, the U.S. sent fleets of planes every few days to burn different cities. And the equivalent size of the city is, is here, like Tokyo is the same size as New York. Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the same size as Seattle and Akron, were the 68th and 69th cities that we burned. So it was already the policy to kill civilians, and we killed 800,000 Japanese civilians. It was horrific, and it's really not in our history books. The difference was with a nuclear bomb, it only took one bomb rather than fleets of planes. A 15 kiloton bomb, a kiloton is the size of a thousand tons of TNT. The biggest conventional bomb in our arsenal is 10 tons. So this is a thousand times, 15,000 times bigger than any conventional bomb. It killed about 150,000 people. And this, these are small 15 kilotons by today's standards. It's a 1% of a megaton. It's three millionths of the current war arsenal. And we, our arsenal is so big that if we dropped a Hiroshima bomb every two hours, starting on that day 77 years ago, we still couldn't use up our current arsenal. This is the plane that did it, the Enola Gay, named after the mother of Paul Tibbetts, the pilot. This is a mock-up of the bomb that was dropped, the uranium bomb. This is a picture of me back when I had hair and it was black at the Smithsonian. On the left is a picture of the mushroom cloud created by the atomic bomb. On the right is a picture of a cloud that was grew three hours later after the bomb was dropped by the fire that was started in Hiroshima. This is called a pyrocumulonimbus. It would pump the smoke up into the upper atmosphere. The energy of the fire was a thousand times larger than the energy of the bomb. So the, the way that climate is changed by nuclear bombs is that it produces fires, which put smoke up in the atmosphere that block out the sun. The reason there was nothing like this during the years of testing in the atmosphere is because all the tests were done over deserts or over the ocean where there was nothing to burn. Here's a drawing done by one of the survivors of what the fires look like on the ground. And this is what Hiroshima looked like afterwards. All the cities were burned. All the, all the buildings were burned, except for a few metal uh, structures. This is a mock-up of the plutonium bomb called Fat Man that was dropped on, on Nagasaki three days later. So here's a picture in the museum of Fat Man and the bomb. And this is what the mushroom cloud over Nagasaki, that was about a 20 kiloton bomb. And this is what Nagasaki looked like afterwards. Now, fortunately, we don't have many examples of cities burning to use as analogs. But in 1906, there was an earthquake in San Francisco and it started a fire. And Jack London, the famous author, was asked to uh, write about it for Collier's, which was a popular magazine. For those of you that young people don't know what a magazine is, it's, it's, it, it's like a book with glossy pictures in it. Uh, that you don't need uh, devices to read. He wrote, within an hour after the earthquake shock, the smoke of San Francisco's burning was a lurid tower visible 100 miles away. And for three days and nights, this lurid tower swayed in the sky, reddening the sun, darkening the day, and filling the land with smoke. I watched the vast conflagration from out on the bay. It was dead calm, not a flicker of wind stirred. Yet from every side, wind was pouring in upon the doomed city, east, west, north, and south, 
Strong winds were blowing upon the dim city. The heated air rising made enormous suck. Thus did the fire of itself build its own colossal chimney through the atmosphere. And this is San Francisco afterwards. Take a photograph. The previous was a drawing. This is a photograph taken from kites. So we worked on nuclear winter when there were only two nuclear nations uh, or, uh, in the 1980s. And now there are more nuclear nations, and including India and Pakistan. And we started working on this about 15 years ago. We rekindled our work in this. And we thought, well, India and Pakistan might be the place where there would be the most likelihood of a nuclear war. There have been skirmishes all the time uh, in, in Jammu and Kashmir, including four small wars fought, and both countries have nuclear weapons. What would happen if a skirmish escalated and because of poor communication, misunderstanding, panic, and fear, it started a nuclear war between India and Pakistan? So we looked at that 15 uh, years ago, each country had 100 weapons, so we assumed they would each use half of their arsenal and use bombs the same size as were used in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. But it would produce 5 million tons of smoke, uh, 5 teragrams or 5 million tons of smoke. The direct fatalities from blast, radioactivity, and fires would be horrific. 27 million people, half the number of people that died during World War II. And now they are still continuing to build bigger bombs and more weapons. And so now they could have a war with more weapons and bigger bombs. And we looked at these scenarios of it will produce uh, 27 or 37 million tons of smoke, not 5 million tons. And the direct fatalities would be larger and horrific. We also looked at U.S. and Russia. They can still produce uh, using their arsenals, their strategic arsenals, and using 100 kiloton bombs, they could produce 150 teragrams of uh, 150 million tons of smoke. So we studied all these different scenarios with our state-of-the-art climate model. Here's a movie showing, oh wait, let me go back one. Here's a movie showing uh, where the smoke would go for a five teragram case for India and Pakistan. The smoke would be lofted up into the stratosphere. Maybe 3% of the material that burned would turn into black carbon smoke heated by the sun, lofted up, and blown around the world. The graph on the left is the vertical profile of the atmosphere. We live down here in the troposphere. Uh, this line here is the tropopause, the boundary between the stratosphere and the troposphere. The difference is that in the troposphere where we live, rain can wash particles out, and the average lifetime is about a week. But in the stratosphere up here, there's no rain, and so uh, it would last for a year, not a week. So one particle up there would have 50 times the effect of a particle in the lower atmosphere. And it'll be lofted by the sun and lofted the upper stratosphere and last for years. If the US and Russia had a nuclear war, it would be a lot more smoke. And again, it would be lofted into the stratosphere and last for years. So for the Russia, a U.S. case, we tried to look at would it really be nuclear winter? Because in the 1980s, the models weren't as good, and we they were wondered whether uh, it would really get below freezing. And so, uh, what we did is we looked at two places where agriculture is important: Iowa and Ukraine. We just happened to choose Ukraine back then, and we plotted a time series of how the temperatures would change. This is one year after the war, the, the change in surface temperature in Northern Hemisphere summer, June, July, and August. So temperatures would fall by 20 degrees uh, Celsius, um, 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And here's a graph. The uh, black line is the normal seasonal cycle in these places in degrees Celsius. So zero is freezing. In the summertime, temperature would get up to in the 20s, set in the eight, like 70s, in the 70s Fahrenheit, and it would get below freezing in the winter. And this is where we could do agriculture. In our simulation, the war started on May 15th, putting the smoke in the atmosphere and temperatures will quickly plummet below freezing and stay completely below freezing for the next summer and the next summer. And so it's obvious that you can't grow any food uh, when the temperatures are below freezing or even when only a few days get, get above freezing. For each of these scenarios I showed you, we IP is India, Pakistan, 
UR is US Russia, and this is the amount of smoke. And we calculate how much the global average surface temperatures would change. For India and Pakistan, between one and five degrees Celsius. Now five degrees Celsius or Kelvin is the amount the global temperature cooled 20,000 years ago when there were mile thick ice sheets covering North America during the height of the ice ages. We have ice age temperatures for five years. And then as the smoke finally fell out, the temperatures would gradually warm up. For US Russia temperatures would get uh, 10 degrees uh, Celsius, 20 degrees Fahrenheit below freezing. You wouldn't produce an ice age because once the smoke uh, left, there would still be some, uh, the, the snow that had accumulated on the continents would start to melt. But this is temperature. How would this affect food? So we took a crop model that would uh, calculate uh, how the main crops that we eat, corn, rice, soybeans, wheat, and grasses, which are eaten by animals. And we also had a model of how fisheries would respond. And for cattle and sheep, about half are fed by pasture and half are fed by crops. And we used FAO data to look at every country, what crops are grown. We took the data on temperature, precipitation, and sunlight from our crop model for each of the scenarios and saw how much you could actually grow. And we uh, looked at imports and exports for each country. And this paper, which we just published, which is open access, you can download it. You can download it at this at this link, or you can download at the link I'll show you at the end. Uh, global food insecurity and famine from reduced crop, marine fishery, and livestock production due to climate disruption from nuclear war, soot injection. Lily Shaw was the chief author. She did most of the work, and the rest of us, either oceanographers, experts on, on crops and uh, crop modelers. This is the most complicated figure I'm going to show you. For each of the scenarios of different amounts of soot, we calculated how many calories on a global average would be available. Now, you need uh, the average uh, calories that people eat. These are kilocalories, 2,300. Uh, and uh, for the five and, and uh, higher teragram case, the livestock case is yellow. Uh, if you keep our livestock and keep feeding the livestock, and the portion that livestock eat is this hatched area. But what, what if we didn't uh, keep feeding animals and use the calories to, to feed humans? And then we would get, those are the pink cases and different fractions of food would go to humans. And so if, if it's under 1900 calories, you're losing weight and really can't do your normal daily activity. And if it's under 1100, you die from malnutrition. So the US Russia went, nuclear winter case, most people would die. And then we just, we assumed people, each country would not trade food. We calculated what fraction of people left in the world would be in danger. Uh, 2 billion people could die for the 37 teragram case. More than 5 billion people could die from the nuclear winter case. And so here's a map showing this distribution. The for the 37 teragram case, an India-Pakistan war, and 50% of the livestock feed went to humans, no trade. Many countries are green. They, they would, uh, especially countries that, are, that grow a lot of crops, don't have many people, they would have enough food to eat. But countries in higher latitudes uh, would suffer. And for the India, for the U.S.-Russia case, the brown areas, almost everybody would die. And this includes nuclear nations like the United States, Russia, China, uh, France, England, and all the NATO countries. A few countries would be better off like Argentina and Australia because they would be able to, uh, they don't have large populations, they're big exporters, they could produce enough for, for themselves. But if you thought environmental refugees are a problem today, what about all the hungry people in flotillas of ships arriving on their shores? It's still not a good, not good news. So to summarize, for India, Pakistan, I took two of the cases, 16 and 37 teragrams, and US Russia, 150 teragrams. This is the number of direct fatalities I told you about before. This is the number of people that would not have any food at the end of year two. We assumed that people would eat up all the food that was stored and have to depend on agriculture. 
it would be more than 10 times the number of people that would die from the direct effects. So the direct effects, of course, would be hor hor horrific, and that's one reason we haven't used nuclear weapons, but the indirect effects on the rest of the world would be much, much worse. A war between India and Pakistan could kill one to two billion people. Uh, US, Russia, NATO war could kill most of the Earth's population. Uh, Brian and I wrote a paper called Self-Assured Destruction. Most people think it's mutual assured destruction. But if one country like the US or Russia attacked the other one and the other one didn't do anything about it, uh, didn't even respond, everybody in that country would die from starvation. So if you threaten to use your nuclear weapons to deter an attack, you're talking like a suicide bomber. Now, what, have, what do people do about it? This is a map showing nuclear weapons free zones in the world. There aren't any nuclear weapons in the Southern Hemisphere. In fact, South Africa developed nuclear weapons and gave them up. Brazil and Argentina did some research but decided they'd be better off without them. The red countries are the, are the nuclear weapon states, two in Europe, one in, in, North, in the Western Hemisphere, six in Asia. And the yellow ones are ones that are part of treaties with these nuclear weapon states, thinking that their, their nuclear weapons will help defend them from uh, nuclear war, South Korea, Japan. Uh, and then the orange ones are NATO countries that actually have some tactical US nuclear weapons. Now, the nuclear weapon states claim that they maintain their arsenals, not to use them, but for deterrence which I think is a specious argument. Deterrence certainly doesn't deter uh, attacks from cyber criminals, from terrorists, from other countries with conventional weapons. And there's many examples of this. The Soviet Union took over Eastern Europe and the US was the only nuclear nation. Our weapons didn't deter them. Israel was attacked by Egypt and Syria in the Yom Kippur War. Israel had nuclear weapons. Britain was attacked by Argentina in the Falkland Islands. Their weapons didn't deter them. Who won the wars in Afghanistan? Soviet Union, US, who won the war in Vietnam? Ah, but they say, well, it's to deter other nuclear weapon states from attacking. Well, it's true. There's been no major war between nuclear powers since World War II. Why? Well, there's actually been a general decline in violence, growth in international commerce and interdependence, increase in number of democracies, NATO, UN, European Union. It's impossible to know the rule of nuclear deterrence, but a lot of other factors come into play. But even if you believe in deterrence, it has to last forever. There can't be any mistakes, uh, that, and, but there have been so many accidents that almost started a nuclear war. Now, President Kennedy, John Kennedy, understood this problem 60 years ago. He said to the UN, every man, woman, and child lives under the nuclear sort of Damocles, hanging by the slenderest of threads, capable of, being, capable of being cut at any moment by accident or miscalculation or by madness. Weapons of war must be abolished before they abolish us. But that has not happened yet. So the policy conclusions are nuclear weapons can be used if they exist. A nuclear war could start tomorrow by accident, hackers, computer failure, bad sensors, or unstable leaders. Nuclear arsenals don't deter attacks from non-nuclear states, terrorists, and pandemics. And the only way deterrence could work between nuclear states is if states believe other states are willing to kill themselves by using their nuclear weapons, that there's a guarantee there'd be no unintended use. The only way to prevent a global catastrophe is to get rid of nuclear weapons. So what have I done? I'll just finish talk telling you what I've done about it. I gave a TED Talk uh, in Hoboken, and it's had like 30,000 views. Uh, Brian Toon gave a TED Talk about dinosaurs and nuclear weapons. He had over 8 million views. There were conferences on the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons organized by ICANN. I went to the first one in Oslo in 2013. There was a poster about our, our smoke and uh, talk about Carl Sagan and, and the quotes from uh, Gorbachev. I went to the second one in Mexico and over 100, 146 nations came, and there was a third one in Vienna, and this led to ICANN getting a treaty to ban nuclear weapons passed in the nuclear in the UN General Assembly. And they got the Nobel Peace Prize in 2017 
for i love their i love their logo by the way uh uh for its work this is the the peace sign is from the campaign for nuclear disarmament from england it's from semaphore for nuclear disarmament n and d if you didn't know that for its and the it got the peace prize for its work to draw attention to the catastrophic humanitarian impacts of any use of nuclear weapons and for its groundbreaking efforts to achieve a nuclear a treaty-based prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, Brian and I wrote an uh, op-ed in the New York Times, Let's End the Peril of Nuclear Winter. A couple of people read it, Rich Clark and R.P. Eddy, and they wrote a book called Warnings about Cassandras, people who warn about things and nobody pays attention. And I'm chapter 13 in that. Uh, Jim Hansen's chapter 12 about global, uh, about global warming. Chapter 11 is about pandemics. <laughs> Too bad nobody listened to us. Fortunately, the, my chapter hasn't come to come to fruition i got they gave me a cassandra award uh and uh the they uh rp eddie said uh uh his work on nuclear winter demands a global audience and uh but uh, i'm trying to get people to listen so i got the chancellor's award for global impacts from rutgers two years ago and i got the global peace and health award from ippnw also winners of Nobel Peace Prize and Physicians for Social Responsibility. But the biggest award I got was from the Future of Life Institute uh, in August. Uh, they give awards to people that try to save the world. Vasily Arkhipov got the first one, this Russian submarine commander who stopped a nuclear torpedo being used during the, during the Cuban Missile Crisis. And we got the award, I got the award with these people, Paul Crutzen, uh, Carl Sagan, Gira Stenchikov, Rich Turk O'Brien Toon and Jeannie Peterson was the the editor of a Swedish journal Ambio that had this paper by Crutzen and Burks about what would happen after nuclear war. Now the treaty became ratified uh, into force when the fiftieth country ratified the treaty to ban nuclear weapons, and it occurred on the seventy fifth anniversary of the UN in October, twenty twenty. It came into force January twenty second last year and now there are 91 countries that have signed it and 68 countries that have ratified it unfortunately the nuclear nations have tried to ignore the will of the rest of the world that we have to ban nuclear weapons so we keep we keep working on it uh beatrice finn when she accepted the nobel peace prize she said the story of nuclear weapons will have an ending it's up to us what the ending will be will it be the end of nuclear weapons or will, will it be the end of us one of these things will happen the only rational course of action is to cease living under conditions where our mutual destruction is only one impulsive tantrum away. That was five years ago when Kim and Trump were arguing about whose button was bigger. It was pretty scary. Carl Sagan, who died much too early in his 60s, was asked, don't you really want nuclear weapons to defend us? And he said, for myself, I would far rather have a world in which the climatic catastrophe cannot happen independent of the vicissitudes of leaders, institution, and machines. It seems to me elementary planetary hygiene as well as elementary patriotism. You can see what a great communicator he was. I agree. Elementary planetary hygiene demands we eliminate nuclear weapons faster than the current pace. And I hope we can continue living in this beautiful planet for a long time to come. So if you want more information, you can go to my website. All our papers there, this PowerPoint and, and movies and everything are there. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, Alan. We do have some questions. Sure. I'll leave this um, up for a couple, a couple of mi a minute, then I'll turn stop sharing so you can see me better. OK. Um, so somebody asks, uh, would tactical nukes produce similar effects? And we've heard a lot about Putin maybe using tactical nukes in Ukraine. What would be the effects of that relative to um, when he's- So first weapons? of all, tactical nukes are meant for the battlefield. They aren't covered by the New START Treaty. And you think of them as being smaller, but they're actually can be quite explosive, including as big or bigger than the bomb dropped in Hiroshima. So tactical nukes are still, as I said, thousands of times more powerful than any other weapon that you think about. The climate change is occur, occurs from the smoke that's produced by fires. So it really depends what is bombed. If there was a, a nuclear weapon dropped on a missile silo in Wyoming, it wouldn't, there would be very little to burn. It wouldn't produce a lot of climate change. 
if the if nukes are dropped on cities like Kiev and 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 other cities in in uh, Ukraine, then it would produce a lot of smoke, and that would produce a lot of climate change. And it depends how many cities and how much smoke. Hopefully, the answer will be zero. But the great danger of the use of nuclear weapons in Ukraine is escalation. Once a nuclear weapon is used, it, it can screw up communications and people can panic and it could start many, many nuclear weapons being used, especially by, by NATO countries. So that's the great danger. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, um, what are some of the strategies proposed to enforce the abolition of nuclear weapons? So we have a treaty, a New START treaty with Russia, which limits each country to 1,700 de deployed nuclear weapons from on bombers, on missiles, and on submarines. And we have a, a very intrusive uh, examination regime where each country allows satellites to fly over and allows inspectors to go into the country. Russian inspectors come to the U.S., American inspect inspectors go to Russia, open up your silos, let me see your weapons, have the submarine surface and, and show, show your weapons. And so we know uh, very, very well what each country has. And, and an inspection regime would continue if, if, uh, if, uh, for, to enforce any treaty. And when the arms race ended, of course, there were a lot more nuclear weapons. What happened to them? Well, they were dismantled and the uh, material in them was taken out. And the uh, Nunn-Lugar Act, which was passed in the U.S. Senate by a, a Republican and Democratic, uh, Democratic Republican senator, allocated money to pay Russian engineers to take them apart and took them and they took the nuclear material, a lot of it was taken to the United States and used to fuel nuclear power reactors. And so they wanted to prevent it being stolen, uh, people being tempted to sell it. And so we know how to take them apart. We know how to dilute the highly enriched uranium. We know how to store the material and, and keep track of it. Okay. Uh, why do you think more countries are adopting nuclear weapons? Actually, that's not the case. There's 186 countries in the world that don't have nuclear weapons. Only nine have them. India and Pakistan have uh, are the last to get them. And so there, it's been a couple of decades with no new countries with nuclear weapons. And the material, we know how to build them. That's not a secret. And there's enough material in like 40 countries to build nuclear weapons. Why are they chosen not to build them is the question, I think. And uh some countries feel like the nuclear weapons of NATO, of, the United, of the NATO countries help protect them, but many countries have decided they are safer without them and they want to use their resources for other things. Okay. Um, what do we know about China's arsenal? China has about, I didn't show that slide, uh, I, uh, China has about 300 nuclear weapons. All the countries besides the US and Russia have a few hundred nuclear weapons and uh, Israel might have 80 and North Korea might have 40. The others, uh, England, France, China, uh, India, Pakistan have a couple hundred. So if you think you're gonna use them for deterrence, how many do you have to put on the, on the capital of your enemy? And when I ask the audience, is that the people always say, well, one, okay, so maybe you need two. So a few hundred is more than enough, they think, for deterrence. And they could build thousands if they wanted, but they haven't. There are indications in the desert in China that they're building new places to, to put missiles. And so they may be trying to increase the number. And there's, you know, why do we have weapons? Well, Eisenhower warned us about the military industrial complex that there you can make money uh, making nuclear weapons and when the new start treaty was signed by uh obama and medvedev in order to get it passed through two-thirds of the u.s senate president obama had to agree to a modernization of our nuclear arsenal and now the u.s is committed to build spending a trillion dollars to build modern weapons that can't be used and people are making a lot of money from that and so and military careers are, are built on that too. And it's the same in Russia, it's the same in China. So there's pressure inside 
using fear. Oh, we need more weapons to protect us from the enemy. And that's that's what drives a lot of that. So we don't know. Uh, we, we know how many weapons China has. We don't know what their plans are for the future. Uh, and another place where nuclear war might start, of course, is between India, is between China, uh, if, if they try to uh, invade Taiwan. And there's some misunderstanding with a U.S. Uh, ship in the Taiwan Straits. We use India and Pakistan just as an example to, and we have scenario stories of how that much smoke might get into the stratosphere. And then we calculate uh, how climate would change and how the availability of food would change. But there are a lot of other scenarios where you could get that much smoke into the atmosphere. We don't mean to imply that India and Pakistan are evil. There's other ways that you could have a war. What if uh, North Korea uses their nuclear weapons and the U.S. Uh, decides to attack them and the missiles fly over Vladivostok or fly over China, they might think that that's a ruse to attack them and they might start a nuclear war. And so there's all kinds of scary scenarios of how nuclear wars could escalate and put a lot of smoke into the atmosphere. So the uh, we just use those as examples of ways that it could happen. Okay. Um, with climate change uh, trending us towards global warming, uh, how would the cooling effect of a nuclear winter affect that in the long term? Would it uh, neutralize climate change at all in the in the long term, or it, it would have a temporary effect, and then we would go back to normal trending, theoretically? First of all, what I, the story I've just told you is about instant climate change. It would instantly get very cold, and it would be catastrophic. Global warming is real, it's caused by us and it's gradual warming, but this would be instant climate change. People have asked me that question before. So I wrote an article, which is on my webpage called A Modest Proposal. I used the title from Jonathan, Jonathan Swift's satirical article. I hope people understand it's satire. And I said, yes, this would solve the global warming problem. First of all, it would destroy civilization and we would stop burning fossil fuels. And so the emissions of carbon dioxide would, would basically come to a halt, you get global cooling, which would last for a decade. And some of some our work shows that ice, ice sheets would keep the temperature below what it was beforehand, and there wouldn't be any more emissions. And so indeed, it would solve the global warming problem. Now, there have been other proposals to solve global warming, or at least uh, reduce the effects temporarily by putting particles in the stratosphere but it wouldn't involve killing billions of people. It's called geoengineering. It's, uh, or, or stratospheric aerosol intervention where you would fly airplanes up and spray sulfur in the stratosphere, which would create a cloud of sulfuric acid droplets, just like big volcanic eruptions do. And you'd have to, a volcanic eruption puts it up once and it starts to fall out. But we would, the, the, the idea of the scheme is to continuously fly airplanes up and spray sulfate in the stratosphere and reflect sunlight and cool the planet. So that the technology doesn't exist. If we wanted to do it, it would be a decade or more before we could build it. There's a lot of possible uh, terrible side effects. And I have a list of 28 reasons why it might be a bad idea. So, but we're doing research on that to look at the impacts on agriculture, the impacts on on uh, ozone depletion. I mean, it would destroy ozone. You get more ultraviolet radiation is one thing that would happen. You wouldn't have a blue sky anymore. Uh, I asked my students the other day, how many of you have seen the Milky Way? None of them had because they live in New Jersey. But if you've been to a, clear, to a place where the, the sky, there's no light pollution, the sky's clear, it's spectacular. So, uh, uh, but anyway, I gave this talk, a talk in China once. I said, but there'd be no more blue sky. And they didn't know what I was talking about. But uh, so that, that's an idea that people are working on and spending a lot of money on. Uh, the uh, stratospheric geoengineering, but that, that's uh, that's something that maybe could be done and, and maybe it would work, but it would have a lot of side effects, but it wouldn't have the side effect of, of, of killing people. So nuclear war is not a solution to anything. I guess following with that, are you aware of any development of uh, technologies um, to have, say, a nuclear, the smoke from a nuclear holocaust removed from the atmosphere? Is there any sort of... Uh, whether it's in theory or, or in development, <clears throat> any kind of technology that we have that could do that? No, I don't know any way to do that. There is an idea, however, there's been a, there's one paper on it about uh, 
storing in tanks short-lived greenhouse gases. So if, if, it, if the world got cool, it doesn't have to be from nuclear winter. It could also be from a big volcanic eruption or an asteroid impact. You could let all these gases into the atmosphere and they would enhance the greenhouse effect, but then they would decompose over a year, uh, a few years and they would go away. So they wouldn't, uh, so they would sort of have the same time scale as the cooling and sort of counteract the, the cooling. But that would cost tremendous amounts of money. It, it, we don't really have such gases, and it would be, uh, and they could be <laughs> released by accident. And and so nobody's taking that seriously uh, to spend a trillion dollars to make uh, tanks of gases to to stop uh, what would be uh, very uh, unlikely. And and I think if if su if such a system existed it would make it easier to have a nuclear war because people wouldn't worry about nuclear winter that's not a good idea either okay uh, are there any foodstuffs such as fish that would continue to exist and provide a source of food after a uh, nuclear catastrophe our paper includes fish so we looked at the impacts on fish of nuclear war too it would cool the ocean it would uh, affect the basis of the oceanic food chain but it turns out that you could ramp up fishing for a year or two and catch more fish if you had the fishing fleet and if you had the fuel for it and so forth. But the total, our total amount of diet that comes from food is like five, from fish is like 5% of the total amount that we get around the world. Some countries it's much higher, but on the average, it's a small part of our, of our food supply. So, so no, there would be impacts on fish and, and it it wouldn't uh, solve the problem. You can't go fishing if if uh, if there you can't grow food on land. It wouldn't it wouldn't contribute very much. Okay. Uh, how do we know or not know if a country has nuclear weapons? We so there's there there's a uh, Matt McKinsey uh, and uh, uh, what's his name. Uh, they 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 have a website where they have the number of nuclear weapons in every country, and you can see them with satellite images. You can look at whether they have the the enrichment material, and so we can. And most countries declare how many weapon how many weapons they have. The the uh, so so uh, it, if you wanted to make the hard part is making the highly enriched uranium or processing the plutonium, and that requires a huge industrial activity and so you can see that so it does look like iran is trying it has a certain amount of en enriched uranium and we had a deal with them to stop them from proceeding trump unfortunately got rid of it that was one of the hor many horrible things he did and so they they probably could make nuclear weapons pretty quickly if they wanted to but uh we so th they're you, you really can't do it in secret. It requires a pretty big, big effort to do it. Okay. Um, can you discuss your perception of the potential for countries to return to the table to discuss nuclear disarmament? The Non-Proliferation Treaty gave license to the, the P5, the permanent members of the Security Council, the first five countries to have nuclear weapons. U.S., Russia, China, England, and France to keep their nuclear weapons, but it 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 sort of had uh, pressure to not have other countries proliferate. And there's only four other countries that have nuclear weapons, and so they have the the NPT treaty has uh, meetings every five years. I went; they had it at the UN this summer. I went there and gave a talk about this. And Article Six of the treaty commits them to work to reduce and get rid of nuclear weapons, abolish nuclear weapons. And they always ignore that. So it, it's, it, it, unfortunately, there's other pressures, as I mentioned, uh, mainly based on money to keep nuclear weapons. There, uh, when Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Ukraine found themselves with nuclear weapons when the Soviet Union fell apart, they ended up giving them back to Russia. When South Africa made uh, tested a bomb in the atmosphere, we think with Israel's help, they decided to be better off without nuclear weapons. And so many countries, I said, are, I showed are nuclear-free zones. So many countries understand that they're better off without having nuclear weapons. 
and there aren't any nuclear weapons targeted on them. The ICANN, with their Nobel Peace Prize money, it's a group of more than 800 anti-nuclear organizations around the world that that uh, are working to inform the world about the dangers of nuclear war. And that's what I'm doing too. In fact, I, uh, I didn't have time to show it, but uh, I got an email from my former student, Juan Carlos Antunia, who was in Cuba. He said, the Cubans want you to come down here give a, and, and give a talk about climate change. So I went down there, they paid for my trip, they put me up in a fancy hotel, and they said, give a talk about nuclear winter. And Fidel Castro came to my talk and sat there for, for an hour listening to my talk and, and then blogged about how terrible nuclear weapons were. And he, they videotaped my show, my talk, and it was shown on nationwide television the next day. And I went into a hotel to see if my talk was on TV. And they had a Julia Roberts movie showing on, from a DVD. And I said, could you change the channel? And sure enough, there I was giving this lecture. So that taught me that a professor giving a lecture isn't as attractive as a feature film with attractive stars. And so I've I've designed a, a outlined a script of a beautiful scientist in St. Petersburg is collaborating with a handsome scientist in Oak Ridge, American scientist. They fall in love at a conference. Meanwhile, along the Kashmir border, the skirmish starts, and they work together to try and warn the world about an, the upcoming nuclear war. And in my you can have different endings, but in my ending, they they save it. But the movie also shows what would happen if they didn't. And if anybody knows how to get a screenplay written for that, you'd connect with people's emotions rather than their intellect. And it doesn't have to be a feature film. It could be on Netflix. But I've been trying to get that that made. When uh, when I got the Future of Life Award, uh, Annie Drew and Carl Sagan's widow accepted for him and her their son, Sam Sagan, was there. He's a movie producer in Hollywood. And so I sent him this idea and he still wants a better script from me, a better uh, plot outline. So even if you have one, it's hard to get a, a movie made. But I, I, I think that the, I met Michael Douglas, the actor at, at a, a UN thing on nuclear war, and I pitched it to him too. And he knows how to make get film made, but he didn't do it either. But I think you have to raise this issue up in people's uh, list of important things uh, for, for the last few years it's been COVID and and the price of gas and my kids schooling because of Putin's threats and Ukraine nuclear war is much more on people, people's radar so if anybody has any ideas how to use this to to uh, get people to realize the horror of it our nature food paper got a lot of attention so uh, uh, and I've been giving a lot of talks about it. I'm giving a talk in Mexico next week by Zoom about this on the 60th anniversary of the Cuban Missile Crisis. So we're trying to, but Mexico was one of the leaders. They they led the treaty to, to make nuclear weapons, abolish nuclear weapons in Latin America. And they were one of the first to sign the ban treaty. So the rest of the world understands this. And uh, if you have any ideas of how we could pressure them, I do, I'm doing my best to warn people about it, but how can you get, people in the United States to to care about it. This, the New Jersey Senate passed a, a resolution supporting the ban treaty and so, several other states have many many cities are nuclear weapons free zones. So there's a slowly, the ban treaty and its activities are slowly getting this message out at, at grassroots, but, but we're not there yet. So if you have any ideas, let me know. Okay. Uh, in your examination of this uh, topic, do you get any sense from the general populace around the world? Is there a certain sort of apathy about it? Because it's such a um, it's such a huge issue that if it if it happens, it it basically annihilates so many people that people are, are just kind of resigned to this would just be the end. Yeah, there's Mark nothing Twain, to do that, about it. That's the problem. As Mark Twain said, denial ain't just a river in Egypt. If you hear about something so horrible, it feels better just to forget that you heard it and pretend somebody else was going to solve the problem and go on with your life. And that's part of the problem. So uh, it, it is pretty depressing, but my reaction is to try and do something about it. This is, by the way, this is a picture of me and Fidel uh, when I met him. So, uh, so, and that's the book up there. Uh, so the, uh, yes, that's that's part of the problem. In the 1980s, people were really afraid of nuclear war. The arms race was going on, and people were building fallout shelters. Now, other things are on people's radar, and hopefully, 
uh, we won't need another use of nuclear weapons to scare people into doing something about it. And do you have any uh, advice for you know the the common person or average person of what they could do to try to get the nuclear weapons banned? Well, when I talk about global warming, I say it's more important to change your leaders than it is to change your light bulbs. So you've got to get in, in a democracy, you've got to get the policymakers to to do something about it. So it's important how you vote. Uh, when when people like students say, "What can I do? How can I get involved?" I say, "Well, look at what you're good at." Are you a biologist? Are you an artist? Are you a historian? Are you a meteorologist? Do it really well and then apply what you know to this topic. And there's lots of things that you can do. So write to your congressman, uh, write to the president, and then uh, take actions. There's a lot of people that do art uh, to, to try and warn people about it, talk about it, bring it up. And that's that's what you can do. Okay. Thanks so much, Dr. Robach. Uh, I think we're about done. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. I also want to thank Mary Nucci, a professor in human ecology, who is the director of the um, Virtual Science Cafe program. Um, we'll have another one uh, in November, November 18th. Uh, we're going to discuss uh, entrepreneurship. And uh, that is that event is posted on the uh, SEBS alumni page uh, events section. Uh, also a reminder, it is homecoming, um, so please check out the uh, Rutgers University Alumni Association uh, webpage for uh, homecoming activities. Uh, do you have any uh, last things to say, Dr. Robach? I hope I didn't uh, depress you too much. I hope you inspired you to try and do something about it like I am. And like I said, this this presentation will be posted on our YouTube page, and I will share it with um, all the registrants, so you'll be able to have a copy of this. You can watch it again. Well, thank you so much. Have a great weekend, everybody. Take care. Thanks for your interest in my work.